He also has potentially some arguments that he could make about, you know, the the Raffensperger call, for example, because some of that language in that call is is somewhat ambiguous. There's some arguments that he could make about, you know, he was as president trying to investigate whether there really was fraud and that he potentially wanted to use a federal agency like the Department of Justice to do some more investigatory work and You know, there's all these arguments that I don't think are on the merits actually something that warrants a federal defense of supremacy clause immunity. But in terms of this just very initial kind of basic raising something that's sufficient to get into federal court, I think that it's a lot stronger than the New York case. I'm Scott R. Anderson, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for July 13th, 2023. Earlier this year, Donald J. Trump became the first former president to be criminally indicted. A few months later, he became the first former president to be indicted a second time, this time in federal court. And it's not clear that he is done, as Trump and his close associates remain at the center of at least two and possibly more ongoing criminal investigations that have not yet resulted in charges. Nor are Trump's legal troubles limited to the criminal side of the ledger, as he and the Trump organization he runs are also involved in a number of ongoing civil lawsuits. As a result, the leading candidate for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination is expected to spend much of that year in court. To get a sense of the complex litigation landscape facing the former president and catch up on the latest developments, I sat down with Lawfare's two leading trial watchers, senior editor Roger Parloff and incoming legal fellow Anna Bauer. We talked about the criminal cases Trump is facing, what charges may yet be coming down the pike, and how his overlapping trials and the forthcoming election fit into his apparent legal defense. It's the Lawfare Podcast for July 13th, catching up on the Trump trials. So I think it's worth starting this conversation where this trajectory began in the state of New York. Because, of course, the first indictment to finally drop against former President Trump after a lot of speculation on a lot of different fronts came from the New York district attorney and has been kind of hanging in the background as the attention has shifted to some subsequent legal developments, but is still very much ongoing and by virtue of being first through the gates, very well may be the first one that ends up going to trial, although I think that's yet to be seen for certain. Anna, let me start with you. Tell us a little bit about where we are in the New York criminal trial and what some of the more recent developments are in in regards to that matter. Thanks, Scott. So in the New York case, we do, do have a trial date that was set for March 25th. However, one of the first moves that Trump and his team made was to seek to remove the case to federal court under 28 USC 1442. That's a statute that allows federal officials who can raise some kind of federal defense or or say that the conduct that they're accused of was done under color of federal office to remove that case to a federal forum from state court. So that's exactly what Trump and his team did. and, And it's what we also expect that he might try to do in the Fulton County case as well. And so that litigation has been ongoing. There was a hearing that occurred a few weeks ago before Judge Hellerstein in the Southern District of New York, who is a federal judge who will be deciding this question of whether or not Trump can bring his case into federal court and and have it, you know, adjudicated by a federal judge and before a federal jury. And and the judge it seemed to be from reports skeptical of of Trump's claims that he was making these payments to Stormy Daniels and and through Michael Cohen as a part of his federal duties. Um, as most listeners might recall, you know a lot of the uh, conduct that Trump was reimbursing Cohen for. Uh, that conduct occurred before Trump was even sworn into office. So even though some of these reimbursements happened, you know, after he was already in the White House, it it seems like the judge was pretty skeptical of of the idea that Trump did did this reimbursement scheme as a part of his federal duties. And, And the judge has said that he will make a decision within, you know, two weeks of that hearing that was about two weeks ago. So I think that we're we're poised to see a decision from Judge Hellerstein on that very soon. 
So I'm curious, I know you've looked into this issue of removal. I'm curious whether your assessment lines up with what the reported seeming assessment of the judge, although we won't know for sure until we see the opinion, whether you're skeptical of this claim as well. And then assuming it is denied, are there other big procedural barriers in the way before that March trial date? Or does it seem like that's actually real, one that might actually stick at this point in terms of a firm marker we can lay down saying a Trump trial will start on or about that day? Right. I I am very skeptical that this is a legitimate claim under 28 U.S.C. 1442, which which, as I said, is the removal statute. You know, the nexus between the federal office and the conduct is it just seems to removed from from each other. Having looked at some removal cases you know, to me, this really does not fit with anything that I have seen in terms of federal officials who are charged with with criminal conduct under state laws, removing to federal court. This this really just seems too far um, attenuated in terms of the nexus between the conduct and the federal office. Scott, what was the second part of that question? Are there other big procedural hurdles or open questions that need to be resolved that might require a delay past that March deadline? Or is this kind of the big legal barrier? And otherwise, it seems like things might fall into place for that case to actually begin in March as it's currently scheduled. Right. Well, you know, I don't know. There there likely will be some kind of motion to dismiss. There might be other uh, issues that are raised um, if it's sent back to state court that, that gets it tied up or delayed in some way through state court procedures. But in terms of, you know, whether or not it goes to federal court, if it's remanded, then that's all kind of a matter of state law. And, and I, I think that or at least I suspect that, you know, this will be one of the uh, major kind of delays in the case. I I, I really can't say, though, um, what the next few months could bring. Um, It's not clear, you know, what their next steps would be outside of uh, removal. So let's shift our focus then, as that case has really been, at least so far, as far as we can tell from the outside, centered on that motion for removal, not a lot of other activity moving around there since the initial indictment. Let's move further south to the Southern District of Florida, where we have seen the first federal indictment, that first indictment in New York being under state law. Now we have a federal indictment that came down just a few weeks ago in the Southern District of Florida, led by special counsel Jack Smith, focusing on conduct that has occurred since former President Trump has left the White House, specifically regarding his possession of classified records and efforts to, at least in the framing of the indictment of the Justice Department, obstruct different efforts to recover those documents by the FBI. So, Roger, bring us up to speed on where this matter stands now procedurally. What are we looking at in terms of the process, the open questions, and the timeline about how we expect this indictment to proceed against former President Trump and his co-conspirator, who is indicted alongside Walt Mauda, one of his his assistants. Well, the, the indictment, you remember, came down June 8th, and Trump was arraigned on June 12th. Uh, and Nauda has now been arraigned as well. He now has local counsel and counsel, so we're ready to go. the The government has submitted a uh, sort of a sentence, a schedule for w- what it would like to see, how it would like to see the trial proceed, and it's an aggressive schedule that would lead to a trial in December. It has a lot of steps because, as you know, this is a uh, it, it focuses on classified information. We have 31 counts that involve mishandling uh, classified information or, or willful retention of national defense information. And then we have six obstruction counts against Trump and uh, six against uh, Nauda. One of them is only against Nauda. So anyway, 37 counts against Trump. Because of the 31 uh, that involve classified document were operating under the Classified Information Procedures Act, which is a a pretty complex procedure. Uh, It's a way that uh, the government 
can tr it, it tries to balance the government's interest in uh, not compromising highly classified information in a public trial and yet preserving the defendant's right to a public trial. So it's a very tricky business. And so the beginning is we're going to have a hearing, which is actually going to be July 18th, to begin to discuss all of those problems, the, the various hurdles as we go along about how to deal with classified documents. I don't know if that's going to be an entirely public proceeding or not. We don't know if either of the defense lawyers will have even interim clearances by then. Uh, as of the last government filing, which was just a couple days ago, neither had even applied, even though the government has been making efforts for, has told them how to apply as long as 27 days ago. So I believe some of the uh, first uh, classified documents have already been turned over to, well, I guess not to the defense if they don't have their, they're available to the defense if, if they will get their clearances. So I, I assume this will be procedural and primarily about scheduling. The big question is, uh, the, the, gov the, the government set this proposed schedule and Trump was supposed to respond to it, and he did respond to it a f few days ago, but he did not engage as far as saying, here's our counter schedule. He said, no, this is just too, basically, we aren't going to be able to deal with this until after the election. There's just too many important questions, too many unprecedented issues. And plus, I have a lot of uh, 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 trials to, uh, I already, you know, I've got a criminal case I need to prepare for in New York in March. I've got a civil case uh, in New York this October, and, and uh, I've got a campaign to run, and Nauda has to be with me to run my campaign, and we just can't do it. And uh, so the, uh, we're expecting, I'm expecting, to hear uh, the government's response to that response, and then the first really crucial ruling by Judge Eileen Cannon will be what uh, uh, schedules she sets, and will this trial occur before uh, the election or not? So we've got a couple of issues in the MAL trial that have to be resolved. As you noted, there's kind of the general scheduling, there's getting, the, we've had a delay already to some extent, at least in acquiring local counsel for Walt Nauda, the co-defendant. Um, now there's this debate about general trial scheduling and the SEPA issue, which is expected to take a while. I think most people view uh, the December date as a very ambitious one. I think we saw Judge Cannon put another ambitious date kind of on the books. I think it was originally September at some point, but with everybody kind of acknowledging this was a, a placeholder, nothing's going to hold along this ambitious line in kind of moving forward. Yeah, it, it was actually... It was actually August, and everyone just <laughs> said, well, next month, in other words. Everyone understood that was a placeholder. Yeah, and that would be impressive if they were able to pull it together at that, at that pace, to say the least. Do we have a sense from the filings we've seen so far how Judge Cannon is thinking about and approaching these issues? Judge Cannon, of course, a controversial figure who was randomly assigned to this case, but when handling an earlier related matter regarding uh, a special magistrate judge, made a number of rulings that people thought leaned too strongly towards former President Trump, who appointed her, um, was rebuked pretty firmly by the 11th Circuit, not once but twice in that matter. And ultimately, all of her holdings were kind of wiped out. And the investigation was able to proceed. So a lot of people are worried that she, in approaching this set of issues, is going to be not be adequately or duly even handed. Do we have any sense about how she's approaching this so far? How can we get that from the limited ruling she's issued and how she's handled these motions? Or is her first big test really the one on the horizon uh, just now about this push to push the election back kind of indefinitely? There, There isn't really much to go on yet. Um, I think this will be the first uh, big ruling. There was a, a little... <laughs> There was a, a, a little ruling early on where the government, it was sort of interesting at the arraignment, and of course Anna was there, uh, uh, I wasn't, but um, 
at the arraignment, the government didn't ask for any conditions for Nauda and Trump's release and nothing, nothing unusual. But then on his own, the judge or the magistrate judge at that stage um, asked for, well, th- th- that there had to be some restrictions on Trump speaking to witnesses during this phase. And so an agreement was sort of made that the government would make a list of witnesses uh, and it came up with 84 and those people, he would be, Trump would not be supposed to, he would be supposed to not speak to them about the case except through a lawyer. They didn't want to bar him from talking to the witnesses altogether because so many work for him, work at Mar-a-Lago. So the government turned over that list and and then it 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 asked that it, it tried to file that list with the court and asked the court to keep it sealed and then uh a press coalition came in and uh said um we would like it unsealed and before the government could respond uh the the judge jumped in and said I'm not going to seal it. I'm not going to accept it. Uh, You haven't said why I need to accept it. You haven't said why it needs to be sealed. And I'm going to deny the press coalition's motion to intervene on grounds of mootness. So it it was sort of surprising that she, she, she jumped in and did all this stuff before the government could even respond. But I think the government just backed off and realized, well, uh, you know, Maybe I don't need to, maybe we don't need to file that document. We've served it on the other side, and that's all that's really necessary. And that way we'll short circuit the press coalition's effort to make, unseal it. And so we haven't had any follow up motion to, uh, on that score. So we just had a, a, a sort of sudden, forceful reaction, but uh, I, d- I don't know if we can read anything into that. I, I, I think the, the the first big ruling will be uh, on the scheduling matter. In terms of the SEPA Section 2 pretrial conference that Judge Cannon has rescheduled now for this Tuesday, uh, Roger, I know that you mentioned that it's unclear if it, it will be public, but I would note that typically when the government is requesting a pretrial conference under SEPA Section 2, they will note in the filing if they are requesting that it be held in camera or, you know, in private before the judge. Here, they did not do that. And and there has been nothing that I've seen in Judge Cannon's order that suggests that this will be held behind closed doors. And, and so my assumption is that that conference will be something that media and the public will be able to attend, especially given that, you know, there is a presumption of public access in in federal courts um, and in courts in general. So I, I just want to flag that, that I, I do think that at least this conference, especially because it just relates to, you know, scheduling matters, uh, potentially will be available for media and the public. However, as you know, we we know and that listeners will know um, many of these SEPA hearings and procedures uh, will be closed off because of of the subject matter relating to classified information. And do we have a sense of? I know we have a preliminary date as to when that hearing is, although it may still budge. Do we do we know what that's set for? Off the top of your head. So so the first. Pre-trial conference under SEPA Section 2 is set for July 18th. It was initially scheduled for July 14th, which was this week, but it was rescheduled after after Walt Nauda requested a postponement because his, his out-of-town counsel, Stanley Woodward, had a bench trial scheduled in Washington, D.C. this week. So as a result, uh, Judge Cannon agreed to postpone it. And and it will now be held on Tuesday, July 18th, which is just next week. Well, while we are all waiting for that next development in the Florida trial, let's shift our discussion to what looks to be the next possible criminal action that might be coming down the pike um, that you've been following really closely as well, Anna. And that is, of course, the Fulton County investigation centering around 
2020 election interference, uh, the notorious call in which former President Trump asks of the Secretary of State, find me a, a number of, of new additional votes. That has been percolating for a very long time now, but we have very good reason to believe a decision is forthcoming in the month of August. We've been told as much more or less by the district attorney, as I recall. Tell us where we are in that action and what should we, we should be expecting if things go as they've been kind of laid out or projected um, by the DA and others in the, the next few weeks. Right. So as as most listeners will know, but maybe need to be reminded because it's been some time since Fulton County has really been on on the headlines. Fonnie Willis has been investigating efforts to interfere in the 2020 presidential election in Georgia for more than two years now. In May of last year, she impaneled what's called a special purpose grand jury. That's a grand jury that is primarily an investigative vehicle it's not authorized to issue indictments, but it can, you know, gather evidence, compel witness testimony, and then ultimately issue a report recommending indictments. So the grand jurors on that special purpose grand jury spent more than seven months investigating this case uh, involving efforts to overturn the election by Trump and his allies. They ultimately did produce a report, and some of that report was released, though most of it remains under seal. And and we know from comments by grand jurors who did media interviews that the special grand jury did recommend in that report a series of indictments. And then in January, we had Fonnie Willis make a, a statement in a hearing related to that report that indictment decisions were imminent. So there was some expectation among a lot of folks that she would immediately seek indictments from a regular grand jury, which is what she has to do under state law because of this kind of quirky procedural aspect of Georgia law that means that special grand juries can't deliver indictments. We now know, however, that she did not do that. Um, instead, we know from reporting and, and from court filings that she and her team instead spent the next several months doing some further investigative work and attempting to gain cooperation from some targets or potential witnesses. For example, she provided uh, an, or made an immunity, immunity agreement with several of the so-called fake electors. Also, during that time, we saw that Trump and his legal team in Fulton County, Drew Fendling, made their first filing on the Fulton County docket, potentially as a response to the, the comments in the media by special grand jurors who indicated he could be indicted. And in that filing, they sought to quash the report of the special purpose grand jury as well as block any use of evidence that was collected by the special purpose grand jury. And if that wasn't enough, they also want to disqualify District Attorney Fonnie Willis from investigating Trump. And, and they also want the motion to be decided on by someone other than Judge McBurney, who is the supervising judge who has been handling the special purpose grand juries matter for some some times. Fonnie Willis responded to that filing in May, in which she basically argued that Trump didn't have standing and that he had, you know, raised these issues too late. And since then, it's been kind of radio silence on the docket. Judge McBurney hasn't issued any ruling on Trump's motion. And I, I think at this point, I'm not convinced that he will issue any ruling in advance of potential indictments. And then that finally brings us to this week, uh, which marked a new term of court in Fulton County. In Fulton County, they have these two months terms of court. And the start of each term of court is typically when the district attorney will impanel a new regular grand jury that is uh, capable of issuing criminal indictments across a variety of cases. We have some sense that this is the term of court and, and these are the grand jurors who could potentially finally hear the 2020 election case. The reason why we know that is because Fonnie Willis sent some letters 
one to Chief Judge Glanville of the Fulton County Superior Court, and, and then one to some uh, law enforcement offices in Atlanta. And those letters suggested that, or, or at least, you know, heavily indicated that it will be this term of court that she will seek indictments against the former president and and his allies. The window that she set out that we believe uh, an indictment will will come back is between July 31st and the week of August 18th. So we have this three-week window. And yesterday I was in the room for grand jury selection in, in which the grand jurors who some of which will he- likely hear this case, uh, were selected. And that's quite unusual, actually, because typically grand jury matters are shrouded in secrecy and you don't really get a peek behind the curtain when it comes to grand jury issues. So the very fact that members of the media were allowed to be there for a selection, it is kind of in keeping with, with Georgia's very weird grand jury secrecy rules compared to, you know, the federal system or other state systems. But they ultimately did select a group of 52 grand jurors and alternates. And and those uh, individuals are will serve on two different grand jury panels. And at least one of those panels is very likely to consider bringing an indictment against Trump and and some of his allies related to efforts to overturn the 2020 election. So you mentioned earlier that one issue that you expect to come up in the context of the Fulton County trial is the removal possibility of removal to federal court. And presumably, if the Trump legal team follows any sort of similar strategy to what they're doing in New York, that'll be one of the first sort of questions presented to the court if and when there is an indictment. Can you give us a sense about whether the arguments are any better or different in this case than the New York case? Is it substantively more credible, less credible? And and how is the court likely to see it, whether in the same light or a different light? Right. So I will say that it's important to kind of separate out the question of whether or not the removal question is strong here versus the actual, you know, federal defense that he will raise in his likely removal motion. So I just want to say that at the start, um, because I think it's easy to get those two things kind of mixed together. The standard for, you know, removing under a 1442 motion is just that it has to be a plausible or a colorable claim to having, you know, a federal defense that you were a federal official and that what you, the conduct that you're accused of was done, you know, under color of office. So I just want to say that, you know, to start, that standard is actually quite low. It in some ways is almost just about the way that you write the notice of removal and and the way that you can kind of craft your argument if if there's a removal battle. We've seen in the Northern District of Georgia, whenever there are these removal cases, very often, you know, the judge will point out, I'm not deciding the issue of whether or not you actually have immunity or, or a defense or, or whatever. I'm just kind of, you know, making an initial decision that you've at least made an argument here in this notice that, you know, it's colorable. So with that said, I think it's a much stronger argument that Trump can make in Fulton County, as opposed to the New York case, you know, he he very much was the president whenever he was taking these actions, whenever he called Raffensperger or or whenever he had a a potential plan to seize voting machines. and, And all of those things were things that were very much done when he was the president. And, and I think that he also has potentially some arguments that he could make about, you know, the, the Raffensperger call, for example, because some of that language in that call is, is somewhat ambiguous. There's some arguments that he could make about, you know, he was 
as president trying to investigate whether there really was fraud and that he potentially wanted to use a federal agency like the Department of Justice to do some more investigatory work. And, you know, there's all these arguments that I don't think are on the merits, actually something that warrants a federal defense of supremacy clause immunity. But in terms of this just very initial kind of basic raising uh, something that's sufficient to get into federal court, I think that it's a lot stronger than the New York case. So I, I think, you know, maybe that gives you a sense, Scott, of of what I think, but I, I would be interested to hear if you guys have a different view of that. Roger, I don't know if you've done any thinking about this. Uh, I, I have not, independent of talking to Anna about what she just laid out, so I will, I will withhold any judgments pending further consideration. The the extent of my thinking was uh, listening to Anna just now lay out that argument, and I thought it was a convincing argument. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I will say that something I think is really interesting is in terms of how the Fulton County investigation might overlap with Jack Smith's January 6th investigation. You know, it's much harder for Trump to argue that some of the actions that he was taking with respect to Georgia was something that he did under color of federal law if he's been indicted for some of those same actions by the special counsel under federal law. So I, you know, that's something to consider. It's not really something I've thought too much about, but I, I just do want to point out there that, you know, I think that Trump's ability to remove to federal court is potentially weakened if the federal case kicks into gear related to January 6th and and there's some overlapping conduct there that he's indicted for on federal charges. Well, that's a great transition point because that's exactly where I want to go next. Because in addition to the Georgia state investigation, there is still more investigation happening in the office of special counsel Jack Smith, a big chunk of which we know is hovering around January 6th and 2020 election interference, the kind of other half of his mandate separate from the classified documents case. We've seen activity in the investigation. We've seen signs that's very much ongoing, that's very much a live issue. Roger, bring us up to speed about what we know about the state of that investigation and the extent to which it may or may not be headed towards another set of criminal charges, presumably in Washington, D.C., although perhaps in another venue as well. We know that th- this investigation has been going on for a long time. We don't know exactly how long. And we also know that uh, and I'm I'm ta- and I'm basing this on reporting by a, a number of different news organizations. We also know that uh, so many people have already testified that we we have to be near the end. Um, you know, uh, the vice president uh, uh, Vice President Pence has testified. You know, Meadows has testified. Dozens of people, and in fact, recently, NBC and CNN both did. This week, I think yesterday, maybe sort of overviews of all the people who have testified. I think that they are clearly ready for some sort of ruling. uh, uh, There was a sighting of Thomas Wyndham, who uh, was the uh, back in November of 2021. He was the original person that uh, a new unit of the DOJ was formed to begin focusing on what I would call the white collar January 6th defendants, as opposed to the blue collar defendants who, who were the rioters themselves. Uh, Wyndham sort of led that inquiry until uh, for about a year until November of 2022, just after when, uh, just after uh, Trump announced his, that he would run for president and then uh, the uh, uh, Merrick Garland appointed special counsel Jack Smith uh, to take over the investigation. But Wyndham and, in fact, most of the other uh, investigators who had been involved stayed involved. So Wyndham is sort of the number two guy, maybe. And uh, so there was a lot of uh, the fact that he was in the courthouse yesterday made people think well, something important might be happening. But we haven't heard we haven't heard anything, and there was no sighting of Smith himself. So we're really waiting for a decision. We know that the focus seems to be at this point 
on the false electors schemes and possibly that that means the false slates of electors that that were uh, organized and this was part of uh, John Eastman's theory that you you would he would pressure uh, Vice President Pence to stop the counting and and try to um, well there were a number of different theories but but uh, he they would present Pence with two different slates uh, alleging that there was a good faith dispute between which were the accurate slates of electors for for all of the seven swing states and that he could then either send it back to the states or he could choose or he could do something. But anyway, uh, the focus is on these false slates of electors and perhaps also issues about fundraising based on election lies. That might be a, a, a mail fraud type or I mean a, a wire fraud type accusation. The false slates of electors would probably be either a corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding or a conspiracy to defraud the United States under uh, 18 U.S.C. 371. The uh, corrupt obstruction is uh, 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2. And uh, those seem to be the leading theories, but everyone is reading tea leaves. And we, what we also know is that if something is going to happen, it needs to happen now, because you can see already what has happened in the Mar-a-Lago case, that uh, the president is saying, um, the former president is saying, look, uh, uh, you, you're interfering with my campaign, and, and I, I already have all of these commitments I need to prepare for, all of these other indictments. If this holds any possibility of being brought to trial before the election, the decision has to be made imminently. So we're just waiting. And it's worth noting, this is not the only area where we may be seeing additional action by the special counsel. We've seen a kind of flurry of media reports about additional investigatory steps that special counsel's office has been taking uh, or has taken many in regards to Bedminster, New Jersey, where, of course, former President Trump is on tape having at least it sounds like, although he denies it, shared classified documents with a number of people working on Mark Meadows' biography and with another in another incident with someone working for his PAC. There are rumors of other potential incidents in that case. There is a search warrant FBI issued looking for that document or the copy of the document Trump retained that they said they were unable to locate, although the FBI appears not to have opted not to have pursued a search warrant there as they did with Mar-a-Lago. They did subpoena surveillance videos like they did with Mar-a-Lago. So there's obviously a very active investigation happening around Bed- Bedminster that may yet turn into something, particularly because you have such audio recorded acts of actual disclosure, not just retention of classified documents there. And we've seen additional grand jury action in Florida around the Mar-a-Lago action, uh, pardon me, Mar-a-Lago case, where you wouldn't see a grand jury being used if they were just deepening the investigation of the case around these cases. That's not how grand juries are supposed to be used. It would be strongly suggest it's exploring the possibility of either additional charges, different charges against the same defendant, or a different set of defendants. So you may yet see additional charges against other employees at Mar-a-Lago who may be co-conspirators or maybe some additional criminal charges being brought in that action, which will be through a superseding indictment. That's still reading tea leaves, but both things that are certainly plausible. Uh, and then there is also a part of the records case as well, which is the removal of the records from the White House in the first place, um, which probably overlaps a bit in terms of witnesses and other investigations with the January 6th universe of investigation, because it's a lot of people in the Trump White House, but nonetheless, certainly was an initial early focus of the investigation expected to be by the fact there's a grand jury in Washington, D.C. looking at the classified documents cases. Um, And so we may see additional action on any of these fronts coming from the special counsel's office, although it doesn't seem as clearly developed with as much momentum behind it yet as the January 6th line of investigation. So we're seeing all these overlapping criminal cases, and we are 
of course, seeing this is on top of a number of civil cases. We see, you know, the Trump organization is still facing a lawsuit from the New York State Attorney General. We know Trump is involved with a number of lawsuits from uh, Eugene Carroll, in which the Justice Department just recently declined to kind of assert that part of those claims were done in his official duty. And so he is actually, you know, on the hook for a number of charges, in part because of statements he made about Carroll after an earlier case in her uh, decision in her favor um, that he has already lost. We also know that he was recently, a decision was recently made that he uh, he will be deposed or there'll be the opportunity to be deposed in a lawsuit being pursued by former uh, FBI agent Pete Strzok, uh, arguing unlawful termination and a number of other causes in which Trump may be a witness. So there's a lot of demands on Trump's time uh, and a lot of demands on Trump's lawyers, which is kind of a shifting collage of lawyers, but a shrinking universe in the last few months in particular, in terms of who's represented across these different matters. Roger, can you give us a sense from what we've seen in court filings and discussions and statements from Trump's team, actions from Trump's team, you know, how this overlapping set of matters, criminal and civil, is figuring into his legal strategy? How is he juggling them? Does it provide certain advantages or disadvantages to him and his and his legal counsel? Are they using it in certain strategic ways? And what does that mean for, for their eventual resolution and the timeline on which they might be resolved? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. He's certainly using, he has used them in the Mar-a-Lago case in, in requesting the, in, in refusing to even offer a counter proposal for when this that case might go to trial he said no i'm just too busy with all and he has cited the the uh, new york case and the uh, the civil case against trump organization and some of the other obligations of his lawyers you know i this is subjective on my part and maybe not responsive but i have to say the the new york case begins to look like an impediment to these other cases because it gives him a, you know, that's a legitimate argument. I, I've, you know, I need to prepare for a criminal case. And the fact that that criminal case is so much less uh, weighty than these other matters is an issue. And although it's sort of beyond our scope, it, it's also a case, the one in New York, that is politically possibly advantageous to him. Maybe he wants to go to trial in that one. You, you know, he might win it. Even if he doesn't, it it looks political. It looks like a political witch hunt. And it's an impediment to these other cases. But that's more my subjective view than, than I, I, I don't have a insight into exactly how the Trump team is going to play all of, the, all of this stuff. And it is worth noting, at least on the political side, these actions have been a focus of a lot of fundraising activity um, on the part of Trump's political campaign. So there is that intersection as well with the political and legal strategies being pursued. There is one other thing. I'm, I, you know, it, it, we're going to be watching. There's a lot of uh, interest and speculation about the fact that Trump's lawyers in many of these cases are being paid by apparently being paid by the Save America PAC. And people thought, a lot of experts thought, well, that might be okay until he announce, formally announces that he's a candidate. After that, we're not so sure that that's still legal. Well, you know, we're past that point and, and he's still relying on that PAC. And I think sooner or later, that legal issue might come to a head. That would be important if if that pack can no longer pay for these hordes of lawyers, his his situation changes dramatically. So that's something to be looking for in the background. Well, and th- let me turn to you, Anna, for with one last question on this as well, which is that you know you bore firsthand witness to what has become a kind of little bit more common phenomenon for former President Trump and those around him, which is actually some difficulty securing an attorney. Uh, you know, his co-conspirator, alleged co-conspirator, co-defendant, the Mar-a-Lago case, Walt Nauda, spent several weeks and had to postpone his arraignment because he could not secure local counsel. Notably, a number of the lawyers, part of the argument as to why 
both Nauda and Trump say we need to postpone various, both, both the SIPA hearing and the case as a whole, is not just the Trump's involvement in these outside matters, but the fact that the lawyers are involved in a number of outside matters, many of which are related. Uh, we know, of course, you know, lawyers for Walt Nauda is also involved in representing January 6th defendants and a number of other people who also have trials proceeding actively and maybe facing matters on appeal coming up in the next few months in a similar time frame. So I guess, how does this fit into um, managing these sorts of, of resources? I mean, you know, in theory, Trump could, I think, given infinite resources and substantial resources, which he seems to have, hire a slew of lawyers to resolve all these different things that would seem to alleviate some of this pressure. But that doesn't really seem to be what's happening. It's actually really a more limited universe of lawyers than he's had in the last few years. Is that a possible part of the strategy to some extent? Is it just the way we've whittled down to a limited universe of lawyers? And how sustainable does that seem to be if we're going to actually move forward with this um, kind of bevy of different claims against the former president? Yeah, it's a good question to raise, Scott. I, I mean, I can't speak to whether or not it's a part of the strategy or if, you know, there's a another reason, which is just that it's gotten to a point where, you know, Trump no longer is in power in the presidency. So, you know, that kind of prestige of working as a lawyer for the president is no longer there. He's a former president who continues to be under criminal investigation. And and perhaps other lawyers have seen how many of his former attorneys have <laughs> been turned into witnesses um, or how many of his, you know, former um, employees have been turned into defendants or co-defendants. Um, so it, it it may be just that a part of the narrowing of that uh, attorney universe is actually just because, you know, people don't want to work for him and don't want to be his attorney. And then, you know, there also might be some, you know, self-selection issues in terms of Trump, who he wants to represent him. It's he's famously always said, find me Roy Cohn or find me my Roy Cohn, uh, who, you know, was his longtime attorney, who was kind of known as this, you know, pit bull attorney who would be willing to kind of get his hands dirty for Trump and kind of do whatever is is necessary. And so I, I think that it's it's kind of just that, you know, Trump is finding more and more that that there's not as many Roy Cohns out there as as he would maybe like to believe there are. And and so, you know, it's a mix of things. People don't want to work for him and then he doesn't want certain attorneys to to work for him as well, because he's looking for a, a certain type of person and a certain type of of figure. But I don't know, Roger, is that kind of, do you, does that make sense to you? What What's your view on that? Yes, we're getting into speculation, but, but yeah, uh, 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 you know, we've just seen, you see many, many of his lawyers. Uh, we've, in the Mar-a-Lago case, I guess three of them departed shortly before and immediately after the indictment. So a, a lot of strange things happen. There's a perception that he makes strong demands on his lawyers. Obviously, Evan Corcoran is uh, is a witness against him at this point. Um, he's a key figure in the indictment. Christina Bob is uh, involved in the indictment. You know, it's a reputational issue. It's a financial issue issue that you take a lot of risks in signing up to represent this guy. And I, I think, as I was saying, uh, most of them are, are depending on Save America PAC to pay them because they, they nobody has confidence that Trump would ever pay them. I, I, maybe that's unfair, but I think it's in the back of people's minds. One just one more thing is that I want to say it it is I appreciate you saying that all of that is speculation Roger because I just you know want to make it clear that everything that I've said is certainly speculation um but I will say that I think that in in Georgia for example he actually does have a really good and well respected legal team and and I wonder you know as we look at all of these different cases you know, it, it's very interesting to see, you know, where folks are struggling to 
find attorneys and and maybe what the reasons for that are. In the Mar-a-Lago case, for example, I would imagine that there is a, a lot of issues there just because of the specialist nature of of what's required in terms of the classified information and and needing to get security clearance. So that might pose different challenges to finding representation than it would, you know, in Georgia or in New York. And, you know, Todd Blanche, by all accounts, who is is also involved in the Mar-a-Lago case, but, you know, initially was on the New York case. Um, he also, by by many accounts, has a very good repu- reputation in, in New York. Let me close with one last question for you all. Where should folks look next for the forthcoming actions down the pike? Where is the center of gravity in this universe of legal actions likely likely to merge next? What are you looking at most closely for the most interesting or uh, significant developments coming down the pike? Anna, let me start with you. Well, I mean, I, I think because I started out as Lawfare's Fulton County correspondent, I obviously am, am looking to Fulton County. And for those potential indictments that are coming out, I will likely be staking out the Fulton County Superior Court courthouse for a few weeks in the coming month. So, so I think that's what I'm, that's what I'm watching for. And, and I think that, you know, in terms of what's next after that, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, what's in the indictment, what are the charges and who are the co-defendants? Because we we do have some uh, suspicion that, that it's probably going to be um, a case that involves multiple co-defendants. So uh, we will see. Those are the questions that are on my mind right now. Roger, how about you? I see it as a little bit of a race between Jack Smith and Fonny Willis, if that's how you pronounce it. It's very important to get on Trump's congested legal calendar, you know, uh, uh, and uh, be there first and have a claim to it. And I think now that we've discovered that the Mar-a-Lago case really had to be brought near Mar-a-Lago in Florida, where uh, the jury composition may be difficult for uh, to get a unanimous verdict, uh, these other uh, venues become more and more important. So uh, I'm I'm hoping that Jack Smith is going to weigh in soon. Well, I agree with you both. I think Georgia, most specifically, and then January 6th are both most likely territories. But I will throw in there a wild card vote for Bedminster for the simple reason that we'd have seen so many random investigatory facts pop into the media in the last few weeks that happened months and months ago. Clearly, something is happening there. Uh, We don't know exactly what, but I would not be surprised if that pops up unexpectedly as another front in these discussions. But we will have to tackle those issues when they arise in the future because we are out of time for today. Roger and Anna, thanks as always for being here today on the Lawfare Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please be sure to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to check out Lawfare's other podcasts, including Rational Security, a casual, lighthearted chat about national security news that I co-host each week with my colleagues, Quinta Jurassic and Alan Rosenstein. In addition, be sure to visit lawfaremedia.org for our extensive written coverage of national security law and policy issues, and consider becoming a material supporter of Lawfare at patreon.com slash lawfare to gain access to an ad-free version of this podcast and other special perks. This podcast was edited by Jen Patchahel and produced by Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.